All right, well, welcome everyone to this webinar about the PhD program in epidemiology and translational science here at UCSF. My name is Pam Murnane and I'm an assistant professor in epidemiology and biostatistics, and I'll be facilitating the session today. So I'll start with just a few logistics about the webinar. Um, please do use the Q&A function to ask questions at any time. Uh, we have members of our team monitoring these questions throughout the webinar and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, the session will be recorded and available on our website next week. And just to remind you that our application system is now open and the deadline to apply is December 1st. So the focus of this webinar is on the rich mentoring opportunities at UCSF, as well as some of our funding opportunities. Um, and I'll start with a brief introduction to the program, but first I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. And I'll quickly introduce uh, first Dr. Maria Gleemore. She's the director of the PhD program and a professor in our department. Um, she's also a PI on the new data science training grant that she'll share a bit of information about. And Dr. Peggy Cawthon is a professor in epi epidemiology and biostatistics and is also a PI on an aging uh, training grant that she'll share some information about. And we also have three stellar mentors who do fascinating research uh, with us today and including Vinay Prasad, who's an associate professor in the department, Yulin Xuen, um, assistant professor in the department and Scarlett Gomez. So they'll all introduce themselves in a bit more um, detail in just a moment, um, but I'll share first a few highlights about our program. So uh, we're a relatively small program with just over 30 students currently and about seven are in each class. Uh, yet we have a very large faculty. We have over 60 faculty members with uh, primary appointments in the department and over 80 affiliated faculty um, who have primary appointments elsewhere, but also who contribute to the teaching and mentoring in our department. Um, so I encourage you to browse our faculty research interests on the epidemiology and biostatistics uh, website. So in terms of funding, we'll introduce two training grants today, but I also wanna note that many students work as research assistants with funding from a variety of our faculty. And we also, so strongly encourage students to apply for an F31 grant or other dissertation awards, typically at the end of the second year of the program in training. So um, now I'd like to turn to our panelists and ask each of you to introduce yourselves and share a bit about your research focus, what excites you about your work, and specifically for Maria and Peggy to share a bit uh, more information about the T32 grants. But we'll go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Maria Gleemore. Hi, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. It's really nice to be here and get to talk a little bit about our program. Um, so uh, I'm a professor in Epi and Biostats. I have, and I'll first talk about my research and then I'll talk a little bit about the database, the new, uh, one of the new training programs. So my research sort of has three, three intersecting domains. One is about social determinants of health and social inequalities. Um, and I think <laughs> in the COVID epidemic, we've all seen what a, what, a profound driver um, of population health inequalities can be. Um, another area of my research is Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging and related causes of dementia, including stroke. Um, that's a, it's a major population health issue is with global aging, both in the United States and internationally. And a third issue, and these are very related, is about um, drawing causal inferences from observational data. Which it turns out we spend a lot of time with observational data and um, one of the most important challenges that we face is how to really find compelling evidence um, about, about how we can actually make a difference and improve health. And those are causal inference problems. <clears throat> and that's very related to social determinants of health and um, Alzheimer's and dementia because both domains have a, a lot of methodologic problems. And I feel like my colleagues on the, this panel today may say that their domains also have many methods problems, but I feel that I have special challenging methods problems. Um, so that's my research group where we are, uh, we, I have a fantastic group of ranging from PhD students to postdoctoral fellows and um, they're working, working with um, trainees is sort of the highlight of, of faculty life in my view. Um, I'm also the director for the PhD program. I came to USCSF for that role. And um, the PhD program, as Pam mentioned, is, is um, 
everyone gets funding from one source or another, and we have lots of sources that we use. Um, one of them, of course, is, is faculty research grants. Another are these training grants, which NIH awards uh, basically in order to give an institution dedicated money to, to support students. And one of our newer training grants, this is the first year, is part of a network across the country. There are probably, I think there are maybe eight other um, grants, um, uh, similar training grants at other universities. Um, and ours in particular focuses on health disparities and how we use novel data sources and computationally intensive methods to address health disparities problems. And um, we're really excited about this, this grant. It's just uh, super fun because the problems are so interesting. And we've just started our first seminar and I would say everybody finished it just thinking this is just the best of research because it's sort of new stuff that everybody is discovering what can be done. And we are looking for um, trainees next year to come in on, on that training grant. So if you're really interested in computationally intensive methods, if you're interested in kind of innovative applications of emerging data sources, please indicate that, that and, and apply. I'll stop there if you only have more questions. Great, thanks. Um, and also I've noticed um, that uh, Eva has um, uh, put the link to the database um, training grant in, in the chat. So go ahead and click on that if you're interested. And so now um, we'll turn it over to uh, Peggy Cawthon, please. Hi, I'm happy to be here and talk a little bit about my research and training opportunities. So I'm interested in um, uh, studying disability and the development of mobility problems in older adults with a particular focus on muscle. And so that's where most of my research has focused lately. Um, part of that is um, our group has um, coordinated a number of very large cohort studies of older adults, um, including um, some uh, studies that started a few decades ago, and then a more recent study that is quite translational in nature where we're obtaining muscle biopsies from participants in about 1,000 people. So there's a wealth of data in all these studies, which is a great opportunity for students because we don't have as many um, investigators, um, en enough investigators to go around to answer all the interesting questions that could be done. So it's a really great training opportunity to have piles of data lying around to analyze. Um, and like Maria said, we also have a number of particular methodological problems in our area that need to be solved, which is code for a great opportunity to learn about um, epi and apply those methods to a really important question. So uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about my work is helping junior folks be able to get on to use the data from our cohorts um, to address questions and, and teach them how we how we manage these large um, uh, multi institutional projects. Um, I'm also um, one of the PIs along with Maria and Bob Hyatt with of the um, T32 um, training grant for aging, where we have um, folks who are interested in chronic disease and aging um, meet weekly to discuss different issues around those areas. Uh, there's slots for both pre and postdoc students, um, which I think is nice for a training program because then the pre docs get a chance to interact closely with the, the postdocs and the postdocs get an opportunity to, to mentor more junior colleagues. Um, and that's been a very rewarding um, a thing for me to be involved in because we get to learn about different aspects of aging research as well. So thanks a lot. I'm glad to see we, there's so many participants. Thanks so much. So um, next we'll go to Vinay Prasad, please. Well, nice to meet you all. Thanks for having me. Um, I will uh, give out just a very brief summary of, of my interests. So I guess I'm uh, one of the hats I wear is I'm a cancer doctor and I see patients about a day a week here and I do some attending on service. Um, and then in terms of my background in epidemiology, I did a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins and I've been very interested in epidemiology and it's been sort of the backbone of my research for um, a number of years since. Um, and I'm new to UCSF. I just joined the faculty this year and I moved down here from Oregon where I was on the faculty for the last five years. And I guess I would say, I mean, I would talk about maybe two buckets. One are like the themes I'm interested in doing in studying. Um, I think I'm interested in reproducibility. Um, I'm interested in in a lot of specific medical topics, like how we think about cancer from screening to treatment to prevention. 
um, in particular because of my background in cancer, um, but also a little bit general medicine broadly um, from supplements to cardiovascular disease, um, more on the clinical side of things. Um, I'm interested in sort of policy, um, how we pay for, reimburse, um, approve new drugs or devices, how we think about governmental policy, and, and then maybe a little bit of science communication. Um, I'm active on Twitter, for better or worse, um, and uh, I'm interested in podcasts and YouTube and how we can take the things in the academy and disseminate it. And then in terms of in Epi, the sort of methods that I'm interested in using is, you know, really all of the methods that I think other people use as well. Uh, I'm interested in causal inference, but I don't do it as well as Maria does. Um, um, and I think probably my biggest interest is probably meta research and probably meta research around randomized control trials. So meta-analysis, systematic review and that space. Um, and, I, and so I think I, I, that I, that's, that's a pretty much it in a nutshell. Thanks so much. So we'll go next to Yulin Chuen. Hi, um, my name is Yulin, assistant professor here in the department. Um, I'm also new as well, um, started in July 1st. Um, before that, I uh, came from Harvard where I graduated uh, with my doctoral degree in social and computational epidemiology. Uh, so my area is a focus, um, again, I'll do the three buckets. Um, but one is really uh, looking at using computational methods to um, better understand how to predict uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, the second really is trying to develop um, new innovative types of technologies in order to improve population health. And then um, lastly, um, it's really trying to use unconventional data all the way from you know, Facebook, um, Twitter, um, Instagram, Reddit forums, um, to really uncover uh, uncomfortable truths. So um, what I mean by that is, is, is um, kind of the links between the everyday social experiences you have uh, and health. Um, so in relation to uh, racial and, and social uh, justice. Um, I think probably what excites me uh, most about my research is um, just, you know, discovering uh, novel ways to kind of capture again, you know, these, these type of experiences um, that, you know, traditional forms of um, data are not able to capture. Um, it excites me um, to be able to find the breadcrumbs that kind of you can, that lead you to the um, trail, uh, that lead a tr kind of lead a trail of, you um, um, information that's kind of left behind from, you know, your, your social media pr footprint, um, which, uh, by the way, I don't really have any, so I don't use any of those uh, tools. So that's probably a fun fact about me. Um, but yeah, i um, excited to be here and excited for um, students to come to UCSF to, to learn more about what we do. Thanks so much. So we'll go next to Scarlett Gomez. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so I used to always introduce myself um, in these types of panels as the newbie to the group, but with Vinaya Yulin, I guess I can't really claim to be the newbie anymore. I've been at UCSF for, um, I think, going on three years now, and I am a classic epidemiologist by training, but over my 20 years of work, um, have uh, veered towards uh, cancer health disparities and equities work that focus um, increasingly on neighborhood factors and increasingly on structural determinants. Um, I like to tell a little anecdote that when I first started and was writing grants proposing to look at factors like stru structural racism and perceived discrimination that they would just get shut down at study sections um, and look how far we've come. So I think that's really great. Um, I also come as part of a package deal. Um, I am I lead, co-lead a lab called Dream Lab, which stands for Disparities Research from Environment and Omics um, with my fellow um, faculty colleagues, Dr. Ioma Chang and Dr. Salma Sharif Marco. I encourage you to take a look at our website, dreamlab.ucsf.edu, which really describes um, all the work that we have going on. Most of our work is NIH funded, um, mostly NCI funded. We have a pretty vast portfolio that span this focus, um, looking at cancer health inequities and disparities ranging from neighborhood and structural factors to um, biological factors. 
Um, and then the other thing I'll mention briefly is that um, I am also the director of the Greater Bay Area Cancer Registry. Um, if you've taken any kind of cancer epi class um, in your training, you will have um, heard of the SEER and CI SEER program. Um, our registry is one of the original SEER programs since 1973, and I'm very proud to say that I think we have one of the most active and most robust um, SEER registries and very proud to be hosting it at UCSF. So anyone who's interested in doing work on population-based studies of cancer using cancer registry, cancer registry data linked to any other kinds of data sources, um, you would be coming to the right place for that. Thanks so much. Great. Um, well, now we'll go on to, um, I'll ask some questions and we'll kind of go roughly in the same order um, of, for each of the panelists. So uh, the, uh, a question about mentorship. So what do you find most rewarding in, in your role as a mentor? Um, what makes a good mentor-mentee match? Um, what do you look for in a mentee? And any advice you may have um, for students who are looking for a mentor about how to kind of go, go ahead and reach out and um, try to make that match. So that's a bit of a handful of questions. So just kind of your general, <laughs> your general um, perceptions on, on mentorship and, and what it means to you is, is the main point. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, so Maria, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump in. I hope other people feel free to jump in and uh, um, add, to, add to what I say as I'm talking and then we can, we can move on in some order, but, but please feel free to add. Um, I think what's one of, uh, there are many fun things about mentorship. One of the most fun things that has been on my mind lately is seeing people who came in as uh, students or postdocs sort of take off and their careers are flourishing and they're doing awesome things on their own. And um, that's just, just wonderful. And I was commenting last night about um, former trainees who now I get reviewer comments like, you should really look at the work of this trainee and how amazing it is because it's very relevant to you. Um, that's just fun. And, and having trainees who are really get to a point where they're really collaborators and um, teach me stuff and we discover things together is, is fantastic. Um, in terms of what to look for in a mentor, I will say um, above everything else in your PhD, finding a mentor who you really um, click with is, is probably the most important thing because that person will be with you for a long time and um, you really want to make sure that you choose a PhD program where there's somebody that you trust and you're excited about their work and you want to work with them for the next four and a half years <laughs> intensely. Um, and ideally that there's more than one person like that at, at a university. So you have a kind of plan. Um, I think you want to look, of course, at their science and what their science, if their science is exciting to you, it doesn't have to be exactly what you want to do, but it should be stuff that you think, oh, I would be really proud if I could do stuff like this. I would be really excited about this work, even if you will, of course, define your own independent path. Um, you should think about personal interactions and talk to other people who've worked with that person. You definitely want to make sure that you're working with somebody who is respectful and supportive and um, uh, sees you as a human <laughs> and supports you in being a human. Um, PhD programs are stressful. They're just very challenging. Even before the pandemic, they're, ch they're challenging. And you want to be in a community of people who are going to support you to do your best science and, and um, ha have a good life while you're having it. Everybody who comes into a PhD program is an adult and um, is usually balancing a bunch of stuff. So I think those are the those are the things. They really look for, for consonants in terms of the science and um, and whether and on the personal end, whether that person is, is good to work with. I'm going to stop there because I really want to hear from other people, but I'll come back if there are pieces of Pam's question that I didn't answer. Great, thank you. Uh, so how about you, Peggy? Yeah, so uh, I agree with Maria. I'd also add that, um, and something that I think was helpful for me early on is to distinguish between a sponsor and a mentor. And so a sponsor is someone who can pay for you to get your work done. So they have a giant grant, they need a project done, they pay your salary. That's great. That person is not always the same person who can provide excellent career advice. And so sometimes it is, and that's great, but sometimes it's not. And so often that means that you need to have both a sponsor, someone to pay your salary until you can develop an independent career, but also a mentor who can provide you career advice. Um, and often you can find mentors who um, 
you know, you collaborate with them on another project and you have a question about, you know, their career tra trajectory and how you could, you know, emulate what they've done. So it's really sort of always being on the lookout for additional people who might be able to help you with your research. I think a lot of people are really um, uh, hesitant to contact more senior people um, because they think, oh, they're too busy. Or they won't be interested in a student. And every time a student or junior person reaches out to me, I'm always like, wow, that's so exciting. I can't believe they actually read my paper. This is so, ha I'm so happy to actually talk to someone who's, you know, really interested in the science. I've never been thought, oh, what a drag. I have to talk to another student. And I, I suspect that most mentors feel that way too. So, uh, Again, just to reiterate, think of a sponsor and a mentor separately and that there's a lot of mentorship opportunities you can get outside of the main mentorship relationship you'll have with people on your like dissertation committee, for example. Great, thanks. How about Vinay? Um, I, I think it's a great question. I would probably echo a lot of what people have said. Um, for me personally, what I find most rewarding in mentorship is I don't know, trying to really get to know someone over a period of time and help them figure out what they want to do with their life that's right for them. And that's related to the second part, which is, you know, I, I think back about the people I've mentored and I don't have to think too hard because, you know, most of their numbers are in my phone and I still talk to them quite often because my former people I quote unquote mentored, they're now my colleagues. And, you know, I call them to ask them questions about what they're working on or vice versa, or they read something I wrote and they have some thoughts and so they call me up. Um, and so I really like the fact that, you know, we're now colleagues and, and friends to a large degree. Um, what do I, well, I guess I'd say, wh um, what advice do I have for students? I really think um, Maria's point is, is really well taken. I think um, one of the things you can do before you think about, you know, there's a broad pool of people you could consider. One of the things you could do first is I highly recommend, you know, read people's papers. If you can find a, a lecture they gave that's on YouTube or something like that, you can get a sense of what they're studying, what, what motivates them. Um, and I do a lot of that actually, even for my colleagues to kind of learn about their work too. Um, and then when you figure out people who you have shared interests, um, you know, calling or talking to people who've worked with them before, get a sense of what they're like and seeing if your personalities mesh, because I think like Maria said, that is probably the most important thing um, that you get along. It's someone you can feel comfortable talking with and working with over the course of years. Um, and I think the last question was, um, no, I think I think I think that that pretty much covered it. So I think it's important who you work with is very important. Um, your what what you want to get out of it, and um, and and somebody who's a productive scientist is probably a prerequisite. But I think in our department, that's true of everybody. So that's that's for taken for granted. So it's really about the fit. Super, thank you. How about Scarlett? I totally agree with everything that um, the panelists have mentioned. And I think just, I guess the only sort of other additional things that I might add um, is that I've mentored quite a few um, students from different, you know, sort of um, levels over the years, and there's just not a one size fits all approach. And I think it's important on both ends um, to find again that match factor. Um, but it needs it's it's essentially a very personalized and very tailored experience. And um, I think that from my own experience as both a mentee and a mentor, um, both sides, but especially the student has to be prepared to be flexible. Um, and what I've um, found from working with students is that often they come in with a pretty um, uh, with a pretty defined idea or somewhat defined idea that they define over time, which I think is great. We definitely want to see that. But for whatever reason, sometimes that idea might not work out. The data set's not available to you or doesn't have the critical variable that you're looking for. And so I think oftentimes we have to be prepared, and this is science, um, how do we adjust our research question um, while still being mindful of I need to get my degree in X number of years um, to be able to accommodate those kinds of little obstacles that come up. So flexibility, I think, is, is really going to be a key characteristic. Super, thank you. How about you, Lynn? Um, so, okay, going through the questions, I think the most uh, rewarding part of like a mentor-mentee relationship is actually learning from my students, to be perfectly honest. Maybe that's because of the type of data that I use. I'm always really shocked to see 
um, the type of you know new data sources and social media data that is out there um, that I necessarily um, did not explore. Um, and I think you know I think the youth today um, are just extremely I think they're extremely intelligent and the conversations that we have really bring me a lot of honestly bring me a lot of growth. Um, and then I, I love it on the other side of things is um, being able to like have um, my students learn from me. So, you know, watching them, you know, progress in, in terms of their knowledge, I think is really important. Um, in terms of what makes a, a good mentee, um, to be perfectly honest, I think it's a, a lot to do with um, you know their passion and their drive, you know, for for learning and and for the topic of research. Um, I find that students who are extremely um, interested in what they're doing and and really want to 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 make a difference in public health. Um, I think that you know translates uh, through their work. Um, and then the other part of it is. Um, I think what's really important for a student is their their willingness to grow, um, and so I think you know, especially in a PhD program, it's it's a long road, um, and there's not this instantaneous gratification, unfortunately, all the time. Uh, but uh, I think that the willingness to to learn and to be able to grow um, during this time period, um, if 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 students understand that and, and and want to continue down that path, I think that also is is one that makes a really um, good mentee. Um, then the other one is what to kind of look for in, in a mentor, and I think many people said it, um, but is really kind of the the topic and then the fit, and probably the fit in terms of you know people's styles. Um, and I think probably you know. Um, you know, if you want to spend time, you know, having coffee <laughs> with your mentor and you can't stop talking um, about things beyond probably your, you know, schoolwork and research, that probably makes a really good um, fit um, because I think that's where, um, you know, the best type of research comes comes out of is, is those type of coffee talks that last forever. Um, I think the best way to reach out is to reach out um, and to be persistent. And the only reason I say that it's, um, at least on my end, it's, in, it's not to do with the fact that um, we're not responding to you, but it might be because we have a lot of emails to respond to and we just happen to have missed it. And so a lot of it is based on um, potentially timing um, and whether or not, you know, your email was during a week that was extremely busy or not. So, you know, don't be afraid of emailing again. I think that's really important because um, I don't think anyone here from what I, from you know, what I've seen would be purposely ignoring um, any students that reach out to them. Great, thank you so much. Really terrific perspectives. Um, so another question of interest is, um, so some students come in and they sort of have a passion and they know what they wanna do and they're, you know, they look for and find a good match and, and just kind of go down that route. And other students are sort of attracted to epidemiology because of the methods and they're kind of uncertain maybe about what their sort of research focus should be or that, you know, have maybe a little bit of struggle um, searching for a dissertation topic. So um, I'd love to hear from each of you, your thoughts on how to kind of guide students towards finding that, that passion. So maybe we'll start again with Maria. Um, okay, so there, so there are two considerations. One is what, how you get into a PhD, PhD program, and then the other is how you write a dissertation and finish it. So to get into a PhD program, we really want to see that you can think about science with some level of specificity and that you have been in the field enough to have a sense of important sets of ideas. And so this doesn't mean specifying the data set that you would do your dissertation in, but it does mean saying, really pointing out a, a domain that you're interested in and why you think that you can contribute, why you think that you have something to say here that's, that's important. Um, and so, so it's really easy to say, I want to get a PhD because I want to save the world. And 
that is not a totally convincing PhD application. It is much more convincing if you can say, look, I've seen that there's, the, I've, I've read Vinay Prasad's work and I've seen that there's this overtreatment and that seems like a real problem and they're not incorporating this piece of information, this perspective, and I think that that's a very exciting juxtaposition. So having some level of specificity to demonstrate that you have thought about the problem is very helpful for getting into the program. Um, however, once you're in, it is a time of growth and exploration, and it is okay to change your interests. And in fact, your interests hopefully will change <laughs> um, and broaden. And, and actually that's part of our job for people who come in thinking they absolutely know what to do. Part of our job is to get people to think about additional broader questions. Um, and I would say most people's interests evolve, probably a third stay fairly close, um, but most people's interests evolve. And, and um, Scarlett's point about, you gotta think about what's actually realistic. A PhD is not intended to be your job at retirement. It's intended to be your job for the next four to five years. And um, so you wanna think about what you can actually get done within a, the scope of a, of a PhD. Um, yeah, so, so when you're applying, try to be somewhat specific and clear about what you wanna work. And I guess one other thing is, it's really helpful to have a view about who you would wanna work with. And don't be embarrassed to mention those people in your application because we share applications with the people who we think would be most appropriate as mentors. And you increase our chances of getting that right if you actually just say who you think would be appropriate mentors. Um, and then when you're actually writing your dissertation, of course, you, you wanna think about new ideas and broaden. And we, I guess part of our research rotation, part of our training is really intended to give you in-depth experiences with different research groups. That's part of what the vision of research rotations is. And, it, and for many students, that really helps them settle on a dissertation project. I'll stop there. Thanks, Maria. How about Peggy? Um, uh, I don't have all that much to add, but I do agree with the flexibility. Um, I think a lot of people come in thinking, oh, I'm gonna you know, use this data set and do this um, analysis, and they realize there's a problem along the way. And some people could despair and think, oh, I can't do what I wanted. This is horrible. And it's nice to reframe the, um, those challenges as an opportunity to learn because this is still a learning process. And it's one of the last chances you'll have to really have that formal didactic part of learning. Once you get your PhD, it's really hard to take a class. Um, and so to really use those opportunities to, to you know, that UCSF offers to, um, to grow and to, to see opportunities there. The other thing I didn't mention earlier about what to look in a mentee that some people mentioned, but I just want to re um, reiterate is that persistence is really key for a PhD. And then when you become a um, academic researcher, it's probably the number one trait that leads to grants getting funded and papers getting published. It's not um, that people are brilliant and write down something the first time and it gets published and accepted or um, funded. It's more that people write down an idea, they reiterate it, they change it, they iterate it again, and then finally it's accepted or finally it's funded. And so persistence starts with the application to PhD programs and it continues all the way through. Thanks. Super, thank you. And I. Persistence and being able to hear be told no or rejected and still just, you know, go do one, do it again. And I think that's absolutely that's the that's the that the key is that you get a lot of rejections for every paper you get, you get accepted. Um, I agree with everything um, people have said, I guess the only thing I would sort of add um, is, you know, Maria said something interesting, which is something that I've observed in a lot of people interested in epidemiology, uh, public health broadly, um, even biostatistics, which is, um, you know, we're often motivated by desire to, um, she said, save the world. And I think I, I can't claim that I'm doing work that saves the world, but I think in all of us in our own way, we want to improve some problem, some space that troubles us, that we wish could be a little bit better. And I think um, when you're in the domain of advocacy, it's really easy to, um, to, to say what you think is the solution. Um, but part of the thing you learn in epidemiology is that um, the world is often very complicated and we're really trying to understand the mechanism where we can intervene, what we can do and things that initially sounded good, those might not be the right solutions. And so that's really kind of an underlying theme of the work we do. And so I think 
it's really important that you know epidemiology trains you to be right about it, to be rigorous, to be really good in in the arguments you make. And then I think you got to think about questions that will actually persuade people, get people to change their mind, get people to move on an issue. Um, and I, so I think that part of you know the whole process is learning um, both the methods, but also what are the right questions to ask? What's the right way to frame the problem? What's the right way to think about it? And how to do it really rigorously so that you persuade people who are really smart and thoughtful on this issue. Um, and so I, nobody expects that people will know all that coming in. And I think probably the nice part about any graduate school and training is, you know, hopefully you have some free time in the evenings to read books on different topics or read articles on things that are totally outside what you thought you were interested in. And you never know what will strike um, a spark in you. And you might realize that, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Can I bring it in here? Join it with what this person's doing. And, and you can kind of innovate something new. So I think it's a really great time for exploration and figuring out um, how to you know, quote unquote, save the world in our own way, in our own modest way, um, and, and do it in a way that actually moves moves things forward. Super, thank you. Scarlett. Yeah, actually, th th this is so interesting because I've, um, of late, have I have a daughter who's a senior in high school and she's applying to colleges right now. And so it's, the discussions we've been having have caused me to sort of reflect back on um, where I was during this time. And, and I've come to realize that the PhD program is actually such a pivotal time and, and switch in the trajectory of, my, at least for me, my epi career, because it was the shift from solely focusing on didactic training to really putting that to use, um, but doing it in a very critically thinking way. And, and it's caused me to think about, you know, over time, there's been times where I know I've gone to my mentor and just throw up my hands and say, I feel like I have no good ideas. I'm, I'm done. I've, I've, I'm exhausted with everything I, I have I've put out there. And she just laughed at me and told me to leave um, her office. Um, and come back and, and then I have 50 different ideas. And I think what, where that comes from is a sense of curiosity. And to add to what Vinay said, um, uh, uh, being willing to step outside your comfort area, take all that you've learned from the didactic training, the rigorous training you're gonna get in this um, program. It is, it is very rigorous. Um, the rotations you're gonna go through and taking all of that, but, but being willing to step outside that comfort zone and read literature in economics and read literature in social, you know, sociology. And I feel like that's where I've made the big leaps in learning. Um, and, and, and then taking that training to be able to piece those things together, aha, this is where I need to go. This is where I can apply. Maybe I need to seek out somebody who's applying econ methods in epidemiology and looking at these social factors to push me to ask the question in this way. Um, and I think that takes a certain level of, again, curiosity. And, and, and I think I would just encourage people to read, read a lot. Super, thank you. How about you, Lynn? Um, I think that probably everyone has said what I um, wanted to say. I think, you know, just to reiterate really is, you know, the program, what the program provides you, right, is that training and then the credibility to be able to save the world. So there, I know that everyone has said, you, you do obviously have to have the um, methodological training. Um, you have to have the rigor behind your science. Um, but I think like when you choose a topic um, or your dissertation um, piece, uh, you know, you, I still think you do have to still have your passion um, be driving it. Um, Cause I think that's, you know, when the nights get really tough and the PhD gets really, really long, um, that's what you remember, right? And it, so it does, it is what keeps you going, plus the, the faculty members and your family um, that really help you along the way, um, but they remind you of why you're doing it. Um, and so I think it, it is, I think it is still really important to, to really understand um, what that's going to be, to write it down and to, you know, say it to yourself repeatedly, because, you know, the methods will be difficult and, the point of it is really for you to be able to be able to, you know, combat against um, the people that or, you know, the, the research that's opposing it, which is very good, that pushes you harder. 
Um, but again, I think it's, it's, it's when, when you have that rejection over and over again, not to scare anyone in, in, in the future, but it's true is that, that the persistence, the, what, what drives you is the passion part. Right, is that that the what per, the persistence? You know, what's the fire that is underneath you that keeps you going? Is is probably that um, that interest in the topic and and what you do want to do to really change change the world today and and what you're living in. I mean, that's that's our field right now. Great, thank you. So we have one more planned question, and then we're going to open it up for Q and A. So please do remember to go ahead and just enter questions now or, or later into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And um, since it's our last question, I'm just gonna shake it up a little bit and go in reverse order. So if you, Lynn, if you don't mind, we'll start with you this time. Um, but so our last question is, um, if you could share with us um, among the students that you have mentored in the past, um, what some of them have gone to, on to do after graduation. Oh, good. So like, I can't, th this was an easy one to take first. <laughs> um, so a lot of my students um, have been master students in the past or undergraduates. And, um, you know, uh, I'm a big believer into going into a PhD program, um, obviously. So I'm very passionate about that. And so a lot of my students have gone on to um, PhD programs um, at Harvard, at Stanford, um, a couple of other ones have gone to medical school um, at the University of Pennsylvania, University of Chicago, um, Brown University. Um, and so that's been kind of the trajectory that, that I've had. Um, uh, you know, in the, in the future, um, you know, for future PhD students that I have, um, again, you know, probably, you know, because my passion is towards academia, um, passionate to push them towards this area because um, we need really bright um, people. Um, but um, that's 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 my answer in terms of where my students have gone. Super, thank you. How about Scarlett? Um, yeah, my mentees have gone everywhere that you can imagine. They've um, they're now working health departments, pharma, um, certainly academia. Um, and even within academia, they've been in places where they're primarily teaching um, and or mostly doing research. So it's been, I think that's the nice thing about a degree, an advanced degree in epi. It's, it's a very flexible degree. It really allows you to, gives you the tools to apply it in a number of different settings. Super, thank you. And Vinay? Um, I was just kind of thinking about people uh, in my mind. Um, I, I guess I would say, I mean, I maybe I just say before where, where they went to, I hope like what they got along the way was, um, you know, better clarity in how they think about questions and approach questions. And also, um, we, we could have a long discussion about it, but hopefully a bunch of publications, which is a, a currency, whether or not it's the right currency and how it should be used, that's a, that's a broader discussion. Um, and then where have they gone? Um, the PhD people, the PhD folks who've worked with me, typically as postdocs, um, have mostly gone for faculty positions. Um, the master's students who've worked with me have gone in two directions. One, it's often a springboard for uh, medical school. So a couple of people have gone to medical school. The other direction is some people um, have taken a master's and, and sort of research after a master's and made it sort of a um, career research. And they're continuing with other groups and in other locations. Um, I end up, because I guess I'm a physician, I end up working with a lot of people uh, who are in medical training. Um, many of them are uh, encouraged, uh, cajoled, pushed a little bit to do research along the way. Um, I would say many of them uh, have gone on to whatever the next step is in their arc. Some of them have gone in more of a research direction. And there are a few that I guess I take some pride in thinking that I hope, I feel to some small degree, I help them in influence their decision to, to do a, a research career. Um, and I think maybe just one has gone to work for the industry. Uh, and one I just spoke with this morning, he's going to join um, sort of a health economics consulting firm. So I think it's sort of a range of, of things. Um, and, um, and, and, and I guess that gives you some sense of it. Super, thank you. Peggy. Yeah, I think there's sort of two paths. One is the like cookie cutter academic path where um, you know, if you were to get a PhD in botany, for example, you'd have a postdoc and then you'd apply to be an assistant professor and then try to get tenure and become an associate professor, et cetera. 
end up as department chair or dean somewhere. So that is the cookie cutter approach. And then the other approach is doing something that's different than that. And I think most people end up doing something that's sort of different than that, in part because epidemiology is such a broad field with a lot of the non cookie cutter approaches to how people get to what their career is. So we've had people follow the, you know, the traditional academia career path, but we've also had folks do things that are totally different. Academia, work in health departments, work for, um, you know, large um, health insurance companies to understand disparities and what they do. So I think there's a lot of different types of um, career paths people can take after they finish their PhD that is particularly common in epidemiology, just given how fast and broad it is. Great, thank you. And Maria? Um, I can say briefly, my, my former students are now doing fabulous, amazing work in dementia. Um, and uh, they're doing it in various uh, settings. I can say over the overall for the program, about um, somewhere between a half and two thirds of students graduate and go on an academic track where they're looking for a postdoc, they're planning to, to be faculty somewhere. Um, a reasonable number, because we're in San Francisco, I think that there's a, there's a big demand for people in industry, in pharma, in sort of, um, newer like health startups. So some some graduates go into this, those kinds of, of roles and have been really satisfied as um, best I can tell. I have had really interesting jobs that they're excited about. Um, and then a few go into government. So uh, and and both at the at the local state or federal levels and are doing really important, important work in public health right now. <laughs> So there really is a mix. I think I think there's a default often in PhD programs that you're going to end up on an academic route and you're going to go the faculty route. We try really hard not to embrace that, although it's always implicit because you're just being taught by people who made that decision. But at least we recognize, like, actually, it's really important that we have expertise in. Um, of course, we are very lucky with our local public health department and our state um, um, public health department. So we're very excited when people. Uh, choose different routes. Our goal is that you do impactful public health work. <laughs> Super, thank you. So now we're going to open it up to Q&A and um, Maria will delegate um, some of these questions. So thanks. Okay, so there were a bunch of questions that were about funding and some of them are specifically about F31s and some of them are a little bit more general about funding for international students. So I want to say, um, give a general picture of funding. We do not accept students unless we are confident we can fund them fully. That, that funding comes from multiple sources, including faculty research grants, a little bit of support from the, from the discretionary funding of the program, from the students' own grants. All, almost all students write their own independent training award in, the, um, in their second year of the PhD program. And um, I think Eva put the number in right now for the F31, which is the most common grant, we have about a 90% success rate. And the reason that we do so well is that we give a lot of support. There's a lot of mentorship. Um, as somebody pointed out, F31s, uh, international students are not eligible for F31. So we work very hard with our international students to find other funding sources. There are some federal grants that international students are eligible for, for example, certain F99 mechanisms. We just had a student applying for one of those um, and international research grants and foundation research grants. And, and we encourage even international students who are not eligible for the typical NIH funding to the experience of writing a grant is so valuable. It, I think it just makes our graduates much more, much stronger in terms of the real life afterwards. Um, and so we really encourage people to, to do it, whatever mechanism they end up with. Um, I'm gonna ask Scarlett to talk a little bit about the experience of mentoring, <laughs> mentoring F31s because I think that from the outside, it's hard to grasp how much work it is to put it together and how much your mentors support and commitment makes a difference. Yeah, so I've, um, in my three years here in this department, I've mentored two students um, and was um, peripherally involved in a third student in their application for an F. And um, I, the first thing I'll say is that the department actually has tremendous resources to support students um, in, in their application. There are sample applications, there are working groups, um, and so there's a lot of peer support for that. Um, I think it's super important to work with a faculty who you know will be willing and able to put 
in the time to work very closely with you because it's as much about the content that you put in and the good ideas as it is about grantsmanship. So um, in my previous capacity, I was in a 100% soft money funding position. So I know about grant, grant writing. And so I feel like I've been able to bring that to bear with regards to mentoring the students and helping them on how to craft a compelling grant. I'm proud to say that of the two students, they um, one is, was funded on the second submission and one um, on the first submission got an excellent score. So we're anticipating it'll be funded as well. Um, okay, then another set of questions was about research rotations. And um, I can't remember who all has mentored research rotations, but I will say, so the a core part of the training is that all students do two research rotations. Ideally, they are with groups for people who come in really clear on who they want to work with and they are like focused on that person. We encourage them to do research rotations with other people so that they have a broader experience. Um, a successful, uh, officially a research rotation is about half of your class credits for the term that you do it. Um, unofficially successful research rotations continue for years. Um, our One of our early PhD students, her, her research rotation is the collaboration that she formed is now a foundation of her first R01. She's on faculty at UCLA and uh, that was a successful research rotation. Um, so for students who come in really clear on what they want to do, our goal is to help you have adjacent experiences, build a collaborative network, see how other groups think about problems and how they, what they take for granted, what they don't take for granted. Um, for students who come in really uncertain, then the research rotation is a great opportunity to think about whether a group is a good fit for your dissertation. So the rotations play kind of different roles depending on, on where, you, where you are. Um, and Scarlett, did you want to add anything to that from the perspective of having um, mentored research rotations? Um, I guess not too much. We have hosted a number of students who've come through our lab um, on research rotations. And typically, one thing that we really like to try to en engage in with the students is to understand what their goal is from the research rotation. What specific methods are you really hoping to learn? Um, are you hoping to get a paper out of it? And so we try to insert them into projects that are doable within the rotation period often though oftentimes it does extend beyond that um, and, and really that's consistent with their goal for that rotation. Great. Um, there were a couple of specific questions about the data science training grant. Um, you don't need a computer science background specifically however strength in coding is is clearly an asset part of the motivation why nih wanted these training grants to exist is they sense that people who are really interested in social and behavioral determinants of health often did not come from a strong did not have strong computational skills and strong quantitative skills and so they really wanted to address that so um we we are not looking for people with undergraduate degrees in computer science although we would welcome people with undergraduate degrees in computer science if they had appropriate additional um um, exposures, so but it's not necessary. But being really quantitatively oriented, comfortable coding, these are huge assets that will help you um, progress more quickly. Um, and there was a question about whether that is just domestic or also global. Uh, sadly, health disparities uh, are relevant globally, and so we are we invite people who are interested in both local, global, um, domestic, and global um, issues. Um, okay, is there another, let's see, it's the next question. Um, do trainees have to be funded before they start? Um, no, we won't, we won't accept you unless we're pretty confident that we can fund you, but as Scarlett can attest, before we make admissions decisions, I go talk to faculty and say, how awesome is this student? How likely would you be to fund this person if you had funding for them? Um, and um, we really encourage you to think about also junior faculty, early career faculty, because um, often they don't have as much flexible funding, but we can support. Um, we really encourage students to try to work with them and we'll try to support that. Um, so we simply work for ever, with every, because we're a small program with every student, we can think about how to fund them and make sure that their funding is continuous and solid. Um, there are a couple of questions about clinic, people with clinical backgrounds. I would say about a third of our students come in with a prior clinical degree, um, ranging from an MD to uh, uh, nursing and um, 
clinical dietitian, dentistry. Um, we are happy, uh, definitely clinical degree is not a guarantee of entry into the program. However, we are very happy with the, the people who who've come, have gotten into the program with a clinical background have been fantastic. It's really great to have those people in the program. Um, Vinay, maybe you could speak a little bit about having research training on top of a clinical background and what, how much that, how important that is or not as you're. I, I, I would say uh, it has been uh, a pretty important, and I guess I would say, um, I mean, just in terms of full disclosure, so I did my medical training and then I did most of my um, clinical training. So I was about a decade into that process when I went to Hopkins and did my MPH. So it was towards the end of my training. And I had already been doing research, but I could tell in my own skill set repertoire, there were deficiencies, particularly around epidemiology and biostatistics. And so when I went to do it, I did it with like a surgical approach. You know, I knew I wanted to learn more there. I was going to spend my time there. I was going to try to build those method skills. Um, and I think it has been invaluable because the kind of questions you can even conceptualize um, are, are, are liberated by methods training. Sometimes you, you're, you open your mind up to new questions you, that were previously closed off to you um, because you didn't know that methods background. So I think people who are clinicians who are really thinking about a research career in this space, um, it is a very valuable thing to do. Um, and often you, you maybe more so than, than other folks, you know exactly the classes you want to take and, and what you want to get out of it. One thing that I have appreciated about clinicians who come into the PhD program is they are deeply committed. Like they have made a decision that they need a set of skills to do the research that they want to do. And I think it's very easy. I don't know if it's easy. Um, I encourage all my students to think about the demands of doing excellent science, not the demands of succeeding in science. And um, you, we want all of our students to do both. Um, and sometimes you need different skill sets to do these two different things. And so we, we, we want to give you the skills to do both. <laughs> and the PhD, clinical people come in for a PhD, they, they, they think there's a piece that they need more to do excellent science. And so I encourage that. Um, there was a question about background to be competitive. And since we have a couple more minutes, the background to be competitive. I would say the number one thing to be competitive is to sh is to have been research engaged, to have experience working with a research group that you have actually had the experience that you know what epi is going to be like, and you are ready to commit four to five years to a PhD program because this is definitely what you want to do, um, and so that's that's the strongest sort of background to have. Are there other categories of questions that I'm missing or that we should go to, Pam or? Um, Eva or Haley, I think that I've wrapped up most of the questions. Oh, there's a question about epidemiology versus translational science. Um, people really do do differ across those those interests, and um, there's a strong implementation science training path in our program. And some students do it, and some students do things that look more like traditional epi. And we try to support and encourage both things. If you end up with traditional epi, what we try to push is to say early in your research definition, who's going to use your evidence and why is your evidence important to produce? Um, uh, but some people take a much more applied bent. Okay, I think that wraps up our session. Um, Pam, do you want to? Sure, yeah, I just have a few kind of final wrap up statements. Um, so um, first, I want to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for all of your insights today. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody who helped make this event happen, including Eva Wong Moy, Haley Reeves, Kemi Amin, and Benjamin Wallen. Um, and I would like to thank all the participants, of course. Thank you for attending the webinar today. So if you didn't get a, an, your question answered, we will get back to you if we have your email address already. But um, also feel free to reach out to um, Eva Wong Moy. And I think she's putting her email into the chat shortly, if she hasn't already. Um, and uh, we also would like to invite you, we have another webinar coming up in two weeks um, where we're inviting um, our department chair, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo and Dr. Timothy Lash from Emory University and Dr. Um, Ana Diaz Rue from Drexel. And they're gonna uh, talk about the importance of epidemiology in the COVID area and beyond. And it's, um, it's, we're really excited about um, this discussion coming up. So 
And finally, um, the deadline to apply is December 1, final reminder. Um, so thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.